take about, we've got two passages. We've got 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and Numbers chapter 27. Numbers chapter 27 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. In Numbers 27 is a passage I, I re referenced to a minute ago about, about Moses and Joshua. Numbers 27 verse uh, 15, Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord thy God, I'm sorry, let the Lord, the God of, of, of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and may go in before them, which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not sh as sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun. You notice that's N-U-N, not N-O-N-E. <laughs> A man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thy hand upon him. And set him before Eleazar the priest and for all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. Well, we've laid hands on Bobby, and now I want to give a charge to Bob and to, to R.L., Robert, Bobby, Titus, <laughs> ever who you want to call him, okay? <laughs> ever how you know him, all of the above. But the charge that is involved in the things is over in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Now hang on to Thessalonians because we're going to get there in a minute, but 1 Timothy. Here's the charge Paul gave Timothy and through Timothy to us. 1 Timothy 1 verse 3, I beseech thee to abide still at Ephesus. As I besought thee, I'm sorry, to, to, still abide, to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia that thy mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith. So the charge is don't teach any other doctrine. Amen. Don't change the doctrine that you got from Paul. Amen. 2 Timothy 2.2 2, he says, The things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit the same, the same commit thou to faithful men, who can teach others? Your ministry is not confirmed as success when you teach other people what you know. Your ministry is not confirmed as a success until the people you teach teach others what you taught them. Sort of like a multi-level marketing outfit. You, you know, you've been to Amway meetings and they draw the circle and you get your downline, then you get the next guy, and you don't start making money till the next guy down here. <laughs> you got to work too deep. The, like, it comes out of Paul's epistles. In your ministry, you work too deep. We focus on teaching people, but it isn't just teaching them, it's teaching them to teach others. That's what makes the work of the ministry. You're always working too deep, looking to do that. That's when you, your ministry is confirmed. If I teach Bobby, I put my ministry in his hands. Because if he doesn't teach the next, the next one, then I didn't get my job done. So the, the charge is, don't change the doctrine. Be faithful to it. Don't give heed to, what does it say? Fables. Fables are stories. Christendom, evangelicalism is run on the back of stories. We had so, <laughs> we had so many. We started with 15 and now we have 500. That's a story. That's a report. You don't, you don't pay attention to that. People say, well, we're getting results. Listen, Stephen got results in Acts chapter 7 and you know what it got him? He didn't go from 15 to 500, he went, well, he got, a, he got knocked in the head with rocks. You know, if you're trying to build a mega church, go back to Acts 2, they didn't take five years to get 3,000. They got 3,000 people in one day. Now, that's a real mega church. 
all this stuff, that, but the stories and the excite, people get excited. He said, don't pay attention to that. Don't let it be experience based. Make it doctrine based. That's hard. Because we live from experience to experience. But the reality is what God says, not what experience says. Don't give heed to endless genealogies. That's the who who's crowd. Most people follow people. It's not a bad thing. Paul said, be you followers of me, even as I'm of Christ. We all have mentors. We all have people that teach us and help us, and that's a good thing. But the issue isn't the teacher. The issue is what's being taught. Make that the focus. And then he says, don't do those, but do this. Give yourself to godly edifying. The purpose of local churches, God wants all men to be saved. Saved people come to the knowledge of the truth. Pur purpose of the local church is to take those people that are saved, bring them to the knowledge of the truth where they're functioning so they can go out and repeat the process. It's focusing on getting people saved. Focusing on getting the saved people edified. The result of that is verse 5. The end of the commandment is charity. People are always talking about we need charity. We need love. How we get love. Then they tell us a story about how to get it. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Now if I, you sing like I do, there wouldn't be much of a sweet spirit in places. <laughs> they just love everybody down there, you know. And we feel so warm. I saw back, you're back in the what he just told you not to do. How do you get charity? How do you get the ability to value and esteem the thing of what God does? You get it by doing what he said, by godly edifying. And if you give yourself to godly edifying the saints, you will produce charity. And you produce it out of a pure heart, a single mindedness, and a good conscience. The ability to have a, va a proper valuation of things. And faith unfeigned. Real, genuine faith. The real work of faith. Now that brings me back to, so that's the charge. By the way, in 2 Timothy, he gave him another charge. 2 Timothy, by then, you have the church not in rule, but the church in ruin. By 2 Timothy, he says, all the days you've forsaken me. All these people teach an error. As Janice and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these people resist the truth. I mean, in 2 Timothy, things have just fallen apart. 2 Timothy is the last book in the Bible written. When Paul goes off the scene, he says, here's the way that his body of Christ is in total apostasy. Good luck. <laughs> no, he says, there's, there's trouble out there, 2 Timothy 2. I charge thee. Therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his king, appearing in his kingdom. And see, he doesn't say run to the hills and hide. He doesn't say give up. He says preach the word. Amen. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That verse is full of information. There's going to be times when people receive it, time when they don't receive it. Right. That's why you can't go by stories. Because whatever the season is, your job is just to tell the truth. Preach the truth. Speak the truth. Exhort. Tell people this is important. You need to believe it. With long suffering, they aren't going to get it to start with. You didn't. Take some time. Take some patience. But you get it by teaching doctrine. The godly edifying. In the next verses he talks about people aren't going to, people might not like it, aren't going to like it. And then he says, do it anyway. Because that's the charge. Now, when you do it so that you have unfeigned faith, and that's why I want you to look at 2 Thessalonians. Because yesterday when Bobby was teaching, he used, he used this verse, and I thought, well, that's a, that's the whole thing I want to talk about this morning anyway. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse number 11. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. 
It's fascinating how much interest people have in the power of God. You know, in sickness, we want the power of God to, to deliver us. We want God to deliver us from our sinning. You know, stop. We want to, and, and you have all, we want God to, the power, look, the power of God, look at Hebrews chapter 4. It's important to know where the power of God is. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful. Then where is the power of God? It's in His Word. By the way, that word quick there, everybody is quick to say the word quick means alive. And it does. But it means alive in a certain way. You can be alive and, all, and not able to even get out of the bed. And you aren't very quick. Brother Elvis back there is alive. But he's not very quick. Now there was a time when he was because he, he was fast enough to catch Reba. <laughs> but you understand quick is alive and moves swiftly. Can I tell you that God's word doesn't take forever to get the work done? Think about that. God's word will work quickly. It doesn't take forever. Every decision that you, every, every issue you face comes down to making a decision. A decision takes that much time. Now there takes some time to get you to the decision. We call that conviction. It takes some time then to put the decision into action, the, the, the follow through. But the decision, and God's word works that way. It works quickly. Whatever issue you face in life and ministry, there's the verse, there's the answer. Our job is just to believe it. Because God put his power in his word. And the thing that transfers the power out of his word into us is faith. First, Alan's quoted 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is probably a verse that I personally in my ministry quote probably as many as any other verse. I quote this to myself. I quote this to people I preach to. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when you heard, received the word of God which you heard of us you received it not as the word of men but as it is in truth, the Word of God, which effectually works also in you that believe. God's Word works. That word work means energizes, empowers, stirs <coughs> in you that believe. The thing that transfers the power into your life in whom we have access by faith into this grace when we stand. It's your faith resting in that book. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. If you want the spirit of God to work the life of Christ in you, it'll be his word. And what releases the power of that word is faith. It's our trusting, our believing, our resting in what God says. The, when you realize that, and if you just look at Ephesians chapter 3 real quick. We were looking at that earlier. When you realize that, you realize how important, one, understanding God's Word is, but two, how absolutely necessary it is to believe and trust God's Word. Because it's the trusting of God's Word that allows us to have that Word be more than just intellectual comprehension. 
but allows you to become the energizing force in our inner man. At this point in teaching, <laughs> in my mind, my mind says, draw the three circles. My wife is not in here. She, um, she asked me, are you going to draw those circles? <laughs> you have a spirit, you have a soul, and you have a body. First Thessalonians, he says that God will sanctify you holy, your spirit, your soul, and your body. When we talk about it, we say you have a body, soul, and spirit. James 3 says the wisdom that comes not from above, but from below, is earthly, body, sensual, soul, devilish, spirit. Satan works, the world works, your flesh works, body, soul, spirit. God works spirit, soul, and body. The word that I speak to you there is spirit. God's spirit takes those words, puts it in your spirit. That's what study does. Their life. Your spirit has a mind. The mind of a spirit. What man knows things of a man say the mind of the spirit. Your soul has a mind. As a man thinketh in his heart. One of the functions of your heart is a mental capacity, a thinking capacity. The thing that connects your soul with your spirit is that thinking capacity, that mind. So when you, with the heart man believes, another function, the three functions in your soul, you have a mind, you have a heart, you, you, you have a, 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 a volition, and you have emotions. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. He said, I, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. So your soul has these, you have the joy in your soul. You have emotions. The word comes into your spirit, your faith transfers the power of it into your heart. You believe it. You understand it, you believe it. It then energizes you. You know what happens when you believe something? You get the joy. The God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing. He fills your joy and peace elements in believing. The way your, your, your emotions and your inner man get activated is your faith in the truth of God's word. And your emotions are the connection with your body. Because your, your, your body has the five senses and the emotions. So that's how you're designed to work. So when he talks about this stuff working in you, he's talking about it starts with the word coming in. Your faith, trusting it, giving it the energizing ability to then produce motions. The word emotion, if you take E off of it, you got motion. The thing that is designed to put you into activity, your emotions, they're important. Sometimes we we kind of discount them because we say we don't, we don't operate on the basis of our emotion. That is, we don't operate from body, soul, spirit. We operate from spirit, soul, body. But the emotions are the thing that puts you into motion. You know that your emotions can totally immobilize you. Yeah. That verse says, do the work of faith with power. Not with fear, but boldness. Why? Because fear paralyzes you. You've not been given the spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. So all that's just, I'm saying all that because we're talking about the Word of God being transferred, the power of the Word of God being transferred into my experience. It's not Israel's, it's not Israel's program. Israel's program gave direct zap empowerment. Acts chapter 2, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They weren't even seeking it. They just, boom, he's there, he filled them, and they spake as the Spirit gave them utterance. Direct empowerment. That's what the new covenant gave them. He said, I put my Spirit in you and cause you. When Paul talks about the same idea of being filled with the Spirit, he doesn't say that. He says, be filled with the Spirit. <laughs> that's not something that's done for you, that's something that's a response of faith. We're filled with the Spirit. Well, your life's put under the control of the Spirit of God when you respond by faith to His Word. Amen. The work of faith with power 
is simply accomplished as you believe what God's Word says. It's our faith. And by the way, can I tell you that the, the only physical thing you're ever going to possess that is going to give you the ability to contact the grace of God is the Word of God. Amen. But that physical book isn't God. But it contains words that are God's words. And the way he preserves his word is through the physical text. We don't worship the physical text, we worship the words that the physical text reveal to us. Okay? But that's where God's word works. And it's our faith standing in the facts of God's grace. The facts of what God's accomplished for us at Calvary that gives the Holy Spirit the freedom to bring those truths into our experience and into our daily life. So he says in Ephesians 3, verse 16, that he's praying that, that he would grant you according to the riches of, of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. <laughs> be strengthened with might, with the mighty working power of God. In your inner man. All of the miraculous power that God has to create. Psalm 33 says that he, he created all things by the breath of his mouth. <laughs> his word is set and it's done. Amen. You say, whoa, that's powerful. Amen. All that power, Paul says, I'm praying that that would work mightily in you that it would work, you'd be strengthened with it by His Spirit in your inner man. That's how God's Word works in you. That you might be filled, that Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend. And that's the key to me. What that power of God in your inner man is designed to accomplish is your capacity to comprehend, get your mind around and understand the greatness of what God's doing today. And when that captivates your heart and your mind and your soul, that becomes life. And then it come, gets into your experience. And the power of God's Word so it's the issue of, in our, in our failures, in our defeats, they just come from unbelief. They, become, they come from our dependence upon the wrong thing. That is, upon our resources, instead of the resources that God gives us in Christ. And when he says over in 2 Corinthians, it's in my weakness that your strength is made perfect. When he says, you have, we have this power the excellency, the power of God's Word in an earthen vessel, in an easily cracked pot, something that's just easily crushed. And yet God says, I put it there so that the excellency of the power might be me and not you. The, tr the challenge there is we have to be willing to be weak. And you have to be willing to appear weak. Nobody likes to do that. You don't like to appear second rate. You don't like to appear dumb. You don't like to appear weak, unresourced. And yet we're really not. It's just an appearance because the resource is ours in Christ. And there's victory in that. One last verse and we'll, we'll be through. Flip Philemon. It's always fascinated me that the la there are only five one-chapter books in the Bible. There's only one in the Old Testament. You know what it is? Obadiah. You get to heaven, you're walking on the streets of New Jerusalem one day, and you're going to meet Obadiah in the park, and he's going to say, Hey, did you enjoy the book I wrote? And you're going to go, You, you wrote a book? <laughs> Was it a bestseller? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was quite unique. It's the only one chapter book in all the Old Testament. Oh, <laughs> fascinating book. 
In Paul's epistles, there's only one book that's a one chapter book. Philemon. It's also the last one of his books. And there's a reason that it's stuck on the very end. Because all of the doctrine that's in Paul's epistles, the foundation of, of God's grace, the issue of uh, Ephesians about the glory, that the, the, about the goal of the body of Christ, Thessalonians about the, about the glory that's going to be manifest in us in the ages to come, and the pastoral epistles, the godliness walking and living through the local church. The last thing is Philemon. Because all of that doctrine that he's been teaching you finds a practical demonstration in the life of the little local church at Colossae that Philemon is one of the leaders of. And so after Paul teaches all this stuff, then he says, here, let me just show it to you in life. And you see all of the grace life on display in Philemon. Verse number four, he says, I thank my God making mention of thee always in my prayers. Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. Now here's what he's praying for, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual. Every preacher, every believer wants their faith to be communicated effectively. If you're a parent, you want it communicated to your children. If you're a preacher, you want it communicated to your congregation. If you're a congregation, you want it communicated to your world. That the, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by, now here's how it's going to happen, by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Isn't that fascinating? Amen. The way it's communicated is when all those good things that are in you are put on display. When the life of Christ you see, our job is, 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 is not to go out and decry all the things in the world. Our job is to demonstrate, our privilege is to demonstrate the transforming power of the grace of God in the face of all of that. And that's the rebuke to the world because that's the testimony of God's grace. And the communication of our faith becomes effectual as you acknowledge as you point and say, you know, the thing that controls my thinking is his thinking. And I treasure the way he thinks more than I treasure the way I think. I treasure his values more than my values. I treasure him above all the thousands of things in life that are so much smaller than him that never satisfy, never accomplish anything. And that's the path of victory. That's the path of grace. That's what faith accomplishes. Amen. God help us to, to run to the cross and say, it's okay to be weak because I am. But in my weakness, his strength, his glory is made perfect. Amen. Because then it's his resources and not mine. Right. In ministry, Bobby, that's the key. But listen, ministry is just simply the putting on display of what the Christian life is. Because that's what we're ministering. We're ministering Christ, who is our life. Right. So as you function and live, walk by faith and not by sight. Because in Him, we have access by faith into this grace when we stand. You got to know it, know what it is, and as you learn it, it thrills you to death. And as it thrills you, you become you're bound with thanksgiving. And you remember what it meant to be abounding. <laughs> Just think of the Alka Seltzer and the RC Cola. <laughs> yeah. And it just comes out naturally. You don't have to make something out of it. Right. Now praise the Lord. And I count it a privilege to be able to be a part of, of, of what goes on with Bobby. And to be you, to have you as my friends, and to be your friend.
Father, we thank you this morning for your love and your grace. I thank you for the privilege you give us to be a part of raising a testimony of that grace to the world about us. And I pray that we might renew a commitment in our heart to the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that he who is our life might be the issue in our lives. And we thank you for the privilege of it in his name. Amen.